Okay, so we'll begin. Um, the uh, subject of uh, this afternoon's discussion is something that, a, a, a term that uh, Friedrich Schiller coined, but Lynn made a fundamental advance uh, on, is the question of universal history. This was first, the first lectures at Jena uh, by Friedrich Schiller, who was primarily a historian. He was not a playwright. He became a playwright later. He was, he was originally a historian, uh, uh, and a great historian at that. Uh, and as I've been, many of you have heard at least one or two things that I've done, it's very clear to me what the impulse tendency for all great art is, which is this question of the sublime and, and bringing mankind from a lower state to a higher state. Right? That, that, that is the impulse tendency. And you can only do that through sublime acts uh, that do not fit within the framework of a previous manifold. In other words, there is the, the nature of being human is that human beings are capable of hypothesizing universal physical principles. The, on the basis of those discoveries of universal physical principles, which are necessary, history is driven forward by that process, and no other process. Hmm? It's not a sociological phenomena. History is not a sociological phenomenon. And history never repeats itself. Never. It's built either one way or the other, up or down. But it's built upon discoveries of human beings or the, or the failure of a civilization to discover fundamental principles by which they can move forward. Right? So when we talk about <coughs> universal history, which, which Schiller in the first lectures at Jena was a, a history professor. That's what he was. And in his uh, inaugural lecture at Jena, he goes after two fundamental questions. It's called, the, it's a lecture on universal history. The first question he goes after is what he calls the brotkeler, those who learn for bread, right? Or what he called bread scholars. Uh, and that anyone who learns in order to repeat what was learned in the past, without any analysis of it, without any critical faculties about it, he called the bread scholar or a brotkeler, right? Someone who learns for bread. Okay? And he said, the broker laird is the scaredest bunny in the world, which you, fi you find on every campus. Right? Uh, because any new knowledge is a threat to the knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and therefore, they find creativity a threat to their, what they self-define as their identity, which is repeating ad infinitum, you know, uh, the same lecture, the same course forever, right, with no change, and anyone who comes in and puts something in which is truthful and blows the concept apart, they find that as a fundamental threat to their identity, right, because their identity as, as, as a brotgalaire, as a bread scholar, earning bread by repeating what has happened before and anything new is a threat. I, I think you may have run into a couple of these characters, uh, maybe everywhere you've ever been, <laughs> outside the labor Um Okay. But then the second point, which is less focused on, because it's, it's actually a much more complex point, which I'll take up in this discussion here. He says, what is universal history? Right? In other words, okay, fine, you shouldn't be a bread scholar. You should cherish new fundamental discoveries, incorporate those new fundamental discoveries. But he says something very startling. Hmm? He says the way that a true historian develops universal history <coughs> is from the standpoint of the present, not the past. Hmm? In other words, how did we come to be what we are, not what happened in the past and tell a stupid story about it, most of which you don't even know if it's true. Hmm? In other words, there's an efficient principle involved in universal history. It's an efficient principle. 
And that principle is how did we come to be? There's no such thing, as Lynn has said, there's no such thing as current events. There's only current history. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is not, there is not uh, uh, what people would say is the, the history never repeats itself. It's not a morality play, right? Where the same lesson gets learned and learned and learned again. Forget it. That's not, that's not how we came to be what we are. It's a series of either discoveries or failures of discovery mm -hmm. that impact very fundamentally the question of relative potential population density. This is where Lynn has made a fundamental <coughs> advance beyond Schiller mm -hmm. and beyond anyone who has ever lived. Right? Because, because, because the impact of certain types of ideas has always in the course of history resulted in increases in the relative potential population density. And if it doesn't, in fact, what you thought was a discovery was not. Mm -hmm. You may have been kidding yourself, right? Uh, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of people get enamored with their own creativity, right? And they think they're the queen of the May, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm the greatest this or that who ever lived. And if somebody is willing to tell you that, you're off and running, right? Uh, uh, but you may not be. In fact, most of the time, you find out there's someone a lot better, a lot more profound, and you still got a lot to learn, right? Everybody, except, except maybe Len. That's a different story. <laughs> he has a lot to learn, but from the universe, not from generally other people. But, uh, uh, okay, so anyway, so, so you're looking at it. Now, what is the fundamental singularity of this, uh, of history, in the current time, the American Revolution. In other words, it was this profound transformation is the culmination of historical processes starting from the Solon of Athens and the impact of Egypt on Solon of Athens through what I would call, you define it as a phase space. And I use that in very precise terms because that's the terms of reference that Lynn is going at the question of history. There is one phase space. Starting, you could start very far back, but the way Lynn tends to start is from the impact of the Egyptian uh, uh, discoveries, particularly on Sphérix, mm, and the creation of the Greek uh, 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 discoveries mm, as it impacted on Solon of Athens. Mm -hmm. And then as Solon of Athens and the, the generation of that process as it was reflected in the Peloponnesian Wars. In other words, it's, it, 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 it's an actually defined phase space. Mm -hmm. And after the collapse of the Peloponnesian Wars, uh, the collapse of Greece, there was the rise of Rome. Mm -hmm. In other words, because Greek, Greece collapsed and was actually destroyed by Rome, they actually physically destroyed by Rome in the third century, right? Uh, the the, the, the so-called Roman Republic, which was never a republic, you know, I, I'm going to go through something that's going to shock you in a minute, right? Um, uh, so this phase space of Rome, or not phase space, but this subset called Rome, right, had a very interesting had a had a very interesting denouement, which led to a rediscovery of civilization by Saint Augustine, which which is actually going to be ultimately the subject we get to, right. In other words, in the depths of the collapse of Rome a great philosopher by the name of St. Augustine, right, rediscovers Greek civilization in a, in a, in a profound revolution mm -hmm. from the early patristic fathers. Mm -hmm. And then on the basis of that, we'll go through that, they create a fascinating, around the Carolingian Empire, a fast, one of the most fascinating potential republics in history because it was made by Jew, Muslim, Christian, together. 
which is fascinating, which nobody ever tells you about. Okay. And, and, and on the base, then Venice came in with the Crusades to crush this nascent potential based upon the discoveries of St. Augustine. Then you had a collapse, a, a, a devastating collapse of, of, uh, of, of this process called the Black Death or the Black Plague, right? which wiped out one-third or one-half, depending on the figures are not that good in those days, but the minimum of one-third was likely one-half of the total world population. I'm not talking about you know, just the population of Western Europe, which we know about. But we know in China, in the Russian areas, in the whole eastern areas, at least one-third to one-half of the population was wiped out worldwide. Because, it, because Venice had globalized, <laughs> right? And that's what actually brought the whole system to an end. On, out of the collapse of that, it wasn't inevitable. Don't think of history as inevitable. Hmm? Nicholas of Cusa reestablishes culture again and science again. And, and, uh, which, which leads to, through Dante and Petrarch, who attempted to fight Venice directly, and the ultramontane papacy directly, Petrarch and, and, and um, Dante, right, create in Italy a renaissance, an actual fundamental rediscovery of science and technology, again, which leads to the impulse tendencies, which lead to the, the uh, Henry the uh, Seventh and, of course, Louis the Eleventh, and then, of course, this whole process Right, led to a fundamental breakthrough. I'm, I'm reading a very interesting book. Jeff goes through it quite brilliantly, actually, and I recommend people really listen to Jeff's lecture, that one that he gave uh, last week uh, weekend, but also an, another lecture he gave in Philadelphia, which was brilliant. In my view, was brilliant. You have no idea how unique the American Revolution really is unless you see it from this broad sweep of history. Hmm? I mean, imagine, as I said before, maybe 50 to 100 uh, men sitting in a room in peacetime determining what the nature of their republic would be. That n You have no idea what a complete shock. It wasn't a war. It wasn't a conquest. It wasn't by kings. It wasn't by oligarchs. All previous history is the reason that Europe has such problems today is they really never did overthrow personally the oligarchical system. They had hoped by flanking it in the United States and bringing it back through the American Revolution in through the French Revolution, they could have gotten rid of oligarchism. But they never did, which is why Lynn constantly stresses the unique cultural capability of the United States. Hmm? Because Europe never really did do that job, okay? And therefore, it's a weakness that they have. But if you take the broad sweep, and I'm giving you just a big thumbnail sketch, I mean, the, the most thummy of thumbnail <laughs> sketches, right? That's the phase space we're talking about. In other words, when you start from the standpoint of universal history, because there's a million stories, you know, I, I mean, you go on literally forever telling stories, uh, and, they, and people call that history. And you go from <laughs> class to class, and some professors are entertaining, some are not, right? Uh, you still got to pass the stupid grade. You got to remember a couple of dates. And you forget it the second you walk out, right? Because it's, it, it's, it's not a fundamental question of discovery of what is the nature of mankind and how did we come to be where we are today. Today. Not yesterday. Not the month before, today. There is, no, there is no current events. Never happened. Hmm? Never happened. There's current history. Hmm? And when you see, and that's what intelligence really is. That's why Lynn, I mean, even the freak out, I mean, I really get a kick out of this thing. They go nuts against Lynn in France, right? I mean, just nuts. They, got, they do like France on I-N-T-E-R. I don't know what that means. What does it mean? I-N-T-E-R in French. Does anybody know? Intel? Well, anyway. Uh, 
sounds like underground, but anyway, uh, on tail. But, uh, but anyway, um, they go nuts. 40 minutes, they call him a cult and everything else. He said, but one of the problems is he's got great intelligence. <laughs> I mean, what the hell is that? You know? I mean, we can't just dismiss him because he's got great intelligence. Mm -hmm. so, so that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, anyone listening say, what? What? I mean, this guy's insignificant. He's a cult leader. He's got a bunch of lunatics running around. But we have to spend all of France on Terre, which is the biggest talk show in France, about an American group that has no bearing whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe there's a you know, they duck, in the words of Shakespeare, they duck protest too much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sort of like the guy who walks into the uh, uh, traffic court, and he, knows, and he says, uh, Your Honor, I didn't mean to kill the guy. And Your Honor says, look, this is traffic court, you know. I, <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> The guy's confessing yeah, you know, to murder in a traffic court. Uh, that's sort of what this France on Terre thing is. Uh, but, but, the, but the point being, why does Lynn have such, why does he see flanks that no one else sees? Because he, see, he, experience, he actually experiences it. We have to think about it. He actually experiences it as current history. And therefore, he comes up with stuff that they don't need, they, Franks, they don't even know they had, right? Because he's seeing the total flow of history as one phase space with a series of fundamental principles involved, which, whether these guys know it or not, they cannot violate the very principles that they say don't exist. <laughs> That's what you're getting in this hyperinflationary shock. They cannot, e they cannot violate the laws of the universe. They think they can, which is why every single empire in history collapsed on its ass. Every single one, right? Because they cannot violate the boundary conditions, which is where Lynn is unique, and it's what their flank is. And he's known since 1971, and before then, in 1956-57, right? He's known since that point, given his study of Riemann and shockwaves and metaphors, so remember when Lynn said, I bring 2,500 years of history to every single forecast, so don't give me, an, don't ask me for an ABC of forecasting, right? Mm -hmm. He actually does. He actually does. Mm -hmm. And he, it, it bears upon it, which is why when they get into the ring with Lynn, they don't even climb into the ring with him. <laughs> they, they don't even, they, they said, forget it, you know. No moss, no moss, you know. Uh, you know no more, no more. No, you know, that's it. They don't. They don't <laughs> climb into the ring with Lynn because they're a bunch of Lilliputians, <laughs> right? Uh, right. So that's what's happening. But that's the power that we wield. They cannot even violate their own damn laws. They can't do it, much as they try. That's why no empire has ever made it. Hmm? That that's the reality. Now. Let me sort of give you a, an anomaly, okay? Most of the bullshit you get in school is, well, there was this civilization, there was that civilization, and this civilization was advancement over that civilization, and this civilization was advancement over that civilization. You know, the zeitgeist, this Hegelian crap, right? Let me give you a little obvious example, right, which, which gets to the core and begins to introduce the subject that I want to get at today. At the height, at 400 BC, there were 49 million, as best we can estimate, there were 49 million people living around the Mediterranean. By the end of 400 AD, in the height of Rome, there were 29 million people left. 40% of the world's population, or at least the population around the Mediterranean, you had a 40% collapse from Greece to Rome. Now, Rome came after Greece. Hmm? In other words, if you take it from the standpoint of relative potential population density, the relative pot potential population density under Greece 
was 21 people per square kilometer. Under Rome, it was 11 people per square kilometer. Hmm? So please don't tell me about how you know, everything is an advancement or Rome was an advancement you know, oh, because of their bureaucracy and other crap like that. Right? It was not. Rome was a totally slave society. Hmm? Rome never had a good day in its life. Never a good day in its life. Right? It was based upon the collapse after the Peloponnesian Wars of the civilization that the Greeks had created and the science that the Greeks had created. Hmm? And uh, militarily, they had, uh, you know, barbarians do win a couple of fights once in a while, not over long periods of time, but they do win a couple of fights once in a while frankly, because they're barbaric, right? Uh, and if a, an advanced society does not use technology, look, I'll give you an example, perfect example uh, of this. Solon of Athens and the Greeks after Solon of Athens. Ath the Athenians were the ones who defeated the Persians, not the Spartans. Does that shock you? Because the famous story you're going to hear about the, the famous Spartans who stood at uh, Thermopylae, Thermopylae, I think it was. Uh, was it Thermopylae? Yeah, it was Thermopylae. And there's 400 Spartans held off, I don't know, 100,000 Persians, right, at this pass. And then they got betrayed and they came around and killed them all, right? You know, well, they lost the battle, frankly, right? It was the Athenians, right, who actually defeated the Persians. Mm -hmm. from the reforms of Solon of Athens and the kind of morale and the universal identity that the people of Athens had, their military force were the first ones at, at Marathon, the famous Battle of Marathon, where, you know, every year, it's not every every four years in the Olympics, somebody runs 24 miles. Actually, the story is they ran, this guy ran 24 miles to get the uh, Spartans to come up because the Persians were descending on the Athenians, right? The actual story, first of all, the poor guy died. Second of all, the, the Spartans never made it to Marathon. The Athenians had wiped out the, um, the Persians, okay? And then later, the Athenians at Plataea, were, they were a whole <coughs> group of satraps of, of the Persians. The Persians had run this operation where if anybody joined them, they would have to give troops and they'd have to supply food and other things for the Persians. But the people who lined up, the Spartans, asked the Athenians, you line up against the Persians, the main line of the force, because you guys beat them at Marathon. You know what they're like. You take the main line of the force. Right? So there's this Sparta crap, right? It's, it's just crap. It, 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 you know, it, it was really the Athenians that saved Greek civilization. It was actually Aeschylus, right, who fought uh, at Plataea, right, who writes about this in the Persians. Okay, so Rome was a disaster. Okay, there was nothing good about Rome. It, the more it became uh, imperialist after the Punic Wars against Carthage. They moved down into uh, Sicily and other places, and they started rapaciously looting every single civilization, including the Greeks. Right? They had superior organization, uh, uh, but no science. They rejected Greek science. They had to or import Greeks to do Greek science, uh, and these Greeks didn't weren't, weren't particularly excited about it anyway. Right? Uh, uh, but this idea that Rome was more powerful or more advanced than Greece is not true. Greece destroyed itself internally by the Peloponnesian Wars. Otherwise, Rome would have been no match for Greece. Never. <clears throat> never in a million years. Right? As the one thinker right, uh, um, of Syracuse, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the guy who does the lever work. Uh, Archimedes personally holds off for three years in, in Syracuse holds off the whole of the Roman army <laughs> through technological advancement after technological advancement 
a very small force in Syracuse under Archimedes held off the Roman forces for three years. Hmm? So that, you know, that's why they're afraid of us, frankly. I mean, it's not, they are afraid of us. Right? They, they, they haven't done too well against us in history. Right? All right, so, 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 so when I, so when I went through this, this question of Shakespeare versus Mommsen and Gibbon, which I, I raised in an article uh, years ago, or two years ago. This is significant, right? Because what Gibbon is attempting to do, and he was the Shelburne's, along with Adam Smith, they were trying to convince, they were convinced, Shelburne was convinced, that, that if they could correct the mistakes of Rome, they could, in fact, establish an empire that would never fail, that would never go down. Okay? That's why Gibbons wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. It was a strategic study asked for by Shelburne, mm -hmm. who, who also deployed Adam Smith in a strategic study, to try to, to figure out, could there be an eternal British Empire? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what happened? Uh, given does, as I pointed out in this article, Gibbon does this very strange thing. He goes from the so-called great, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Augustus Caesar, means great, the great Caesar, Augustus, right? Then he skips mm -hmm. Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero. <laughs> And as I said, you, some of you missed that. I mean, he just skips it. I thought I was asleep, you know. I actually thought I'd fallen asleep, and God damn it, you know, I got a problem here. And, you, know, I'm, you know, I thought I was old, you know, I can't remember things. And I read this stupid book, and it's 1,500 pages, right? I said, oh, shit, how could I miss that? Right? So I went back, you know, and it's not there. I mean, it mentions it in one sentence. Right, but it's not there. So I said, "I said, my God! I mean, how could you miss this? <laughs> right? That empires throw up some really crazy people hmm? because of the organizing principle. It's an oligarchical organizing principle, and you get some real wackos like George Bush and Cheney. You get wackos if you if you organize upon this idea, Hobbesian idea of a war of each against all. You get some really crazy people who believe that." Their personalities begin to reflect that kind of thing, right? So I, I so I, I was looking at Gibbon, right? And then then you take a look at Shakespeare, right? Who actually comprehends? See, because the only way you can judge history is from the standpoint of a fundamental principle, which which actually uh, Shakespeare learns from Saint Augustine. Augustine had written a major work called The City of God, which is the only valid work ever written outside of Shakespeare and Lynn on the question of Rome. If you go to any university course in any campus, on any college in this country, they will say Rome was great. Hmm? They will say Rome, you know, was, was you know, a great empire that lasted a thousand years, right? Actually, Hitler said that too, by the way. <laughs> right? And Hitler didn't even give a shit, actually, you know, on one level, whether they survived or not. It was just something that Mussolini told him he should say. Uh, uh, but, uh, but anyway, so, so what's the story? Hmm? And now we're going to get at the core of something I, I want to get at today, right? Because Gibbon attacks St. Augustine, okay, and his analysis of Rome. Gibbon says that really Rome's pagan vitality was sapped by Christianity. That, is, that was Gibbon's real thesis. 
right, that if you organize a, a society based upon universal physical principles, then it will destroy your pagan vitality. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I mean, he's got, um, I, let's not discuss pagan vitality. Uh, <laughs> you got these, sculptures, huh? you got these sculptures in this museum in, 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 uh, in uh, Germany. Oh, yeah. These Roman sculptures. Yeah. That's pagan vitality. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, but, that, but that's the, but that's what Gibbon, in analyzing Rome, thought was their great strength. That they did not, they had pagan gods that gave them great courage and great strength, right, in battle. Okay, and and anything that would destroy people's faith in those gods and that religion, mm, these cults, literally Mithra cults. Right, which came from the degeneration of the Greek cult of Apollo at Delphi, right? these mystery cults. Hmm? This, this was what sapped Rome's capability. The he, in other words, given blames Christianity for destroying Rome. And in a sense, he's right, but not in the sense he means. Okay? In a sense, he's right. Now, what Augustine does in the City of God is he refounds on the basis of, his, first of all, he was a thoroughgoing Platonic scholar. He was the greatest Platonist of his time. Okay? He understood in very fundamental terms the nature of discovery. Mm? Because what he writes, ultimately, Augustine writes a lot, but he writes a number of dialogues on free will and discovery. Right? He's brilliant on this question. I, I, you have to read it. I'm not going to go through it. So that, so that Augustine takes on, in very fundamental terms, number one, that Christianity didn't destroy Rome. Rome destroyed itself because of its pagan beliefs. That the superstition and the lack of a universal principle was the basis upon which Rome could not be cohesive and began to degenerate from the point of the, uh, uh, particularly from the point of the uh, Punic Wars forward. Okay? Now, it's interesting that Gibbon attacks Augustine for saying that. Right? Now, how did Christianity destroy Rome? Because it did. It actually did. For good reason, okay. Because because what you get in the in this particular phase space is you have Rome falling apart, okay. You had at the end phase of Rome, you had on the one hand in the Eastern Empire, which was Constantinople, you had one Roman king. Mm -hmm. In the southern part in Rome, you had another Roman king. So Rome split into the Eastern and Western Empire. Mm -hmm. And that by 400 AD, the, the, on the, the Western Empire was overrun by a series of Visigoths, Ostrogoths, all these different Germanic tribes overran the Western Empire. Mm -hmm. The Eastern Empire was set up by, by Constantine to be defensible and only being attacked on one side by land, it's a peninsula, right? And you would have to attack it three sides by water. And therefore you would have to be a strong maritime power, stronger than Constantinople, to attack it. So therefore the Eastern Empire, set up the, called the Byzantine Empire, right? Set up by Constantinople, survived long after the Western Empire was broken up and overrun by you know, these different uh, uh, tribes, nomadic tribes, right? Now, Augustine is living in Carthage, uh, or, or actually Hippo, which is near Carthage, uh, at the time of the collapse of the Roman Empire. In other words, he's being overrun by these different Germanic tribes, right? Yeah? When did you say the Western part was overrun? 400 AD, right? Um, and that's when Augustine was writing. Now, 
remember the obviously in 33 AD, you know, Christ and the patristic fathers were alive, right? Now, it's unfortunate that these fundies have given Christianity such a bad name, right? Because it really was a revolutionary movement, right? Uh, 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 to refound civilization based upon Imago Dei, but also one of the fundamental questions, epistemological questions, which Augustine reinstitutes almost single handedly at the collapse of the end, along with Ambrose and, and uh, Pope Leo, right? They fight for an idea of man called the filioque, right? The idea that from Christ, who was a human being, both God and human, hmm, that mankind can become, uh, in his flesh, like God. Mm -hmm. in the sense of discovery, not in the sense of physically like God, right? but in the sense of a, a, a fundamentally human quality that gives mankind not as a propitiator, not as a worshiper, but in the flesh can make discoveries. The Arian heresy, which was dominant <laughs> in Byzantium, said that Christ was not, uh, uh, was only, no, Christ was not a man. He may have looked like a man, he may have acted like a man, but he wasn't a man. He felt no pain on the cross. He felt, you know, th this was called the Arian heresy. Because they said only from the Father, only from God the Father, could the Holy Spirit flow. Right? Not from the Son. From the filioque. Right? The filio. The Son. Right? From the Son also. Mm -hmm. Now, we who actually, we are probably the only Christians left on this planet. <laughs> right? <laughs> really. Who we'll actually understand through our work through Riemann and Gauss <laughs> the nature of a manifold that has both visible qualities, tangible, visible qualities, but also has universal qualities. Hmm? That's what they're referring to. It's a fundamental epistemological revolution. Hmm? As Plato in the Timaeus. When it's, it's not, you know, he didn't have like God, you know, Zeus or something, say, hey, I want the universe, bong, it's here. You know, <laughs> you know and throw down a thunderbolt and from the fire. Your father can do miracles, mm -hmm. which is what most people on miracles are, are crazy on this question, right? No. The universe was coextensive with, with God. Hmm? That, that, that these principles were coextensive, same substance. The substance of the universe is must be uh, uh, able to be changed in a creative fashion, otherwise the universe would be evil, which is the Manichaean view. The physical universe is evil, and God is good. And man, since he's physical, is evil, but since he has a, 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 um, a spirit, he can be good in his spirit, but he's evil in his flesh, which is, you know, Jimmy Swagger, you know, or, or, or Pat Robertson or all these other guys, right? You know, my flesh is evil. I can't do anything about it, right? <laughs> it's just evil. <laughs> right? And, and there ain't nothing I can do, you know? And yeah, sure I did all that. Sure I stole. Sure I did that other things, right? But I had no choice. Because the flesh is evil. <laughs> Let me preach on it. Right. Oh, no. I'm not going to go too far. Are you preaching? I haven't heard it all. But this is the Manichaean heresy that, uh, that Augustine was up against. And the Arian heresy, right, which is the same, it's like Manichaeanism, right? So therefore, Augustine had to insist upon a fundamental epistemological approach to the nature of man in the universe. Hmm? And it was a revolution. It was after Plato, the great universal thinker and political organizer, was St. Augustine. Because Rome had fallen apart. And they were being overrun by pagan tribes and a return 
to polytheism and paganism. They called it Arianism and Manichaeanism, but that's what it was, right? As opposed to a fundamental universal principle as guiding man through his life and through his work, right? Okay. Now, Augustine, and, and his confessions, by the way, is one of the most powerful coming to grips with how in the flesh you, you actually discover universal principles. Right? And that, that's what it's about. Okay? So he, single-handedly, much like Cusa, although not in the depth of Cusa, but implicitly in the depth of Cusa, right, rediscovers the principles upon which civilization could be made. He, Ambrose, the guy who recruited him to the church, and Pope Leo. Right? We're, we're all, let me just finish this and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, we're all working together to reestablish civilization in the collapse. Hmm? Now, Rome did collapse in a horrible way. Okay? And you had a dark age in which books, learning, civilization was increasingly being wiped out. Okay. How did it survive? Because it did survive. And actually later became the Italian Renaissance. You'll be surprised. Okay, how did it survive? Huh? Close. That's part of it. Well, it was no. It was actually it's it's very interesting. I'll go through it. I mean, I was sort of rhetorically asking. Irish. <laughs> the Irish. Yeah. The Irish. The Irish monks. Um, Saint Patrick and Columba and Columbine. But let me go through the story because it's, it's interesting. There was a place that even the pagans wouldn't go, which was Ireland. <laughs> Which is true. They just, they just wouldn't go there. It, it was too far away, and the Romans weren't interested in it. Uh, it was a very wild place. Right? They had the Druids, and, uh, you know, and it's a very strange place. Uh, now, the Augustinian order founded a monastic movement. Okay. And the first guy, to, not the first attempt at a monastic movement, because frankly the patristic fathers, you know, Paul and, and uh, um, Peter, they went out and evangelized, right? But Augustine, Ambrose, and Leo uh, organized a very interesting young man by the name of, later by the name of St. Patrick. Uh, and what he does is he takes the Augustinian revolution mm -hmm. and he, after he was made a slave in Ireland he was taken off of his estate and he was a fairly well to do young man he was raided, these Irish raiders came in, raided uh, England, took him off his estate took him back and, and made him a slave right, in England, I mean in Ireland somehow he and in the process of him being a slave, he had to do an inward migration and <laughs> discover God within himself. Hmm? So he does. Then he, he, gets, he gets out of the grip. It's a long story. It's a beautiful story, actually. It's a very interesting story, anyway. Gets out of the grip of these Irish druids and others, right? Mm -hmm. And he comes to Tours, which is in Gaul or France, and he joins an Augustinian monastery, right? And his mission is to go back to Ireland and Christianize the Irish people hmm? based upon Augustinian principles. And he was a very witty, brilliant <laughs> young man, courageous beyond belief, because they, they had no weapons and they had no defense, right? The only thing they had was the truth and what, what they call, what they knew to be the gospel, the truth, right? And they were out to hurt no one. And what Patrick did in this extraordinary way is he took the Irish folk tales and the Irish idiom, which he had learned as a slave, and learned to develop, using their idioms, certain concepts in the vernacular. <coughs> 
He didn't try to preach to them in Latin. <laughs> now, you can imagine what that would have been like. Right? Uh-huh. Maybe we should kill him, you know? That looks like fun. Why don't we just kill him? <laughs> no, they basically, he, he preached to them in, he had learned their language, and he had learned their metaphors and idioms, and he was able to create among the bards of Ireland. Ireland had this very rich uh, uh, history, a very rich history, and and uh, of, of singing of these really um, what do you call them? Epic poems. I mean, they were barbaric, but they were epic poems, and they were sung nicely. And 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 you could use some of the images, right, to convince these tribal chieftains that they were really Christian, right, in some way, right? Not in every way, but some way, right? It was a start, right? Uh, so he was able to, through genius, his own personal genius and his understanding of the Filioque and the Trinity, right, was able to actually recruit and organize every top chieftain in Ireland. Overnight, he converted close to, uh, I think it was uh, uh, two million people. Right? And listen to how the monasteries ran. Very, very fascinating. Because in the Augustinian monasteries, everyone had to work. I read Augustine's uh, uh, piece on... Uh, Augustinian monks, right? Everyone had to work. There was no one, including the top abbot who ran the place. He was the hard. He had to be the hardest worker of all, physically. Work, right? At night they prayed, they read, but they worked, right? When they weren't working physically the land, because they charged no rent, right? When they had land, they were given land by these chieftains, right? Uh, anyone who would come would work for his bread, but they'd get free education. No matter what walk of life the young person came in there, no matter what walk of life, they got free education, free board, uh, uh, everything free, right? Including later land. If they didn't become, they didn't have to become monks, right? They had 40,000 people training out of 2 million the density of literacy in Ireland, in the vernacular, was the greatest of anywhere in Europe. By far, I mean by far. It was, it was, it was a total literacy, it was a movement for literacy and education among all walks of life. From the highest noble, or really chieftain, to the, to the kid, the peasant kid who walked in there was going to get an education. These Monks retranslated and wrote in both literate Latin and literate Greek every single classic that was alive. The only reason we have any classics today, except for a certain Islamic thing, which we'll get to, because that's the other current in this, right? Uh, from Baghdad, actually. Uh, the only reason we have any of these uh, 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 of of uh, uh, well, let's see, Cicero, uh, of any of the Homer, all these other stuff, is because these monks trained these young people, right, to write a literate Latin and a literate Greek and retranslate these books in what they call codexes, right, so that it used to be parchments, right, which were very hard to read. Because if you lost your place, <laughs> you were finished. I mean, you know, because they would just roll up again, and you know, what the hell? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so they, they actually wrote, wrote the codex so that people could go back to the book, right? And there was there was very interesting artwork on these codexes, you know, by these Irish monks, uh, you know, telling of Irish tales and mythical beasts and. Actually, one of the things that St. Patrick had a sense of humor, which is critical in organizing, as you well know. Um, uh, so he would always make the evil guys look goofy, right? 
and, and they, you know, have gargoyles looking goofy, and, you know, Loch Ness, apparently St. Patrick met the Loch Ness monster and scared the hell out of them. <laughs> that kind of, they told stories. You know. Uh, basically an entertainer, but you know you have to do these kinds of things once in a while. Uh, but uh, but the point being that uh, uh, you had. <laughs> but what was so fascinating is that the most advanced, and this this really got me. They had the most productive farms in all of Europe, in Ireland, because these Augustinian monks learn the most advanced agricultural techniques to create surpluses to show that God's work was efficacious, <laughs> right? That if you're going to do God's work, God will yield up to you a good yield, right? <laughs> Through these science and technology. And these were the most advanced. They, they made innovations in water, use of water. They were the best uh, uh, ag agronomists in the, in the world at the time. They were the best uh, water engineers, they milled corn through water, uh, they did all sorts of very interesting things which we suspect they got, and it's a good hypothesis, they got from Harun al-Rashid and, uh, and Islam, actually. There's a reason to believe that. Right? But they were, they were constantly innovating, right? From Ireland to people who graduated from the initial phase after St. Patrick were Columba and Columban. They, they're two different guys, actually. I don't know how they got their names, but that's how they got their names. They, now remember, this is far off the coast of, remember, Ireland is pretty <coughs> far away from Europe, right? In those days, it was pretty far away. And nobody wanted to go there, right? Um, so they were left alone. Now, because uh, I believe it was Columban, uh, Columban wanted the, one of the kings had a full the full gospel, right, and he wanted to copy it. So the king would not this Irish chieftain king whatever chieftain, right, didn't wouldn't let him copy it. So he organized. He was a nobleman, Columban, but he became a monk, an Augustinian monk. He organized his brothers and the other kings to crush this guy so that they could get the gospel, so that they could actually, and they did. But a lot of people got killed in the process. Uh, and he had to do, he himself imposed a penance on himself, and he went to Scotland. And he set up monasteries all over Scotland <laughs> uh, that were connected. Linden's Ford is one of the most famous ones, right? in Scotland, and Christianized all of Scotland as a byproduct of this thing. <laughs> uh, 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 and then Columba, and this is an amazing story, on his own takes 12. It's, uh, they always went, in, you know, they like symbology, 12, right? 11, well, 12 guys, right? W went to Gaul, which was the, um, which was later called France, but it was called Gaul at that point. This was totally overrun by pagan tribes. I mean, there was nothing but pagan tribes all over the place. Within 160 years, they had set up over 200 monasteries and had organized a quarter of a million monks into this monastery. Monks, not, and they were training a whole lot of other people hmm, with these techniques. And therefore, before Charlemagne became the first Holy Roman Emperor, after the collapse of the, the Western Empire, which had fallen into complete disrepair, there was a literacy movement around, and, 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 and the, uh, the question of the filioque was fundamental. That's why these guys did it. If mankind was not capable of reason and discovery, they wouldn't have done it. <laughs> if we were just beasts in our flesh, why the hell would you do this? You would not. I assure you, you would not. Hmm? So the filioque and the question of the fundamental nature of man was what this literacy movement and this scientific movement was based upon. Okay? Okay. They took over Gaul. You had a 
quarter of a million monks. These monasteries became the cities around these monasteries were universities. These universities, around these universities were agricultural projects. Right? And these young men and women, and as many women as men, right, were participating in this, right, became a literacy movement. Right? So before Charlemagne ever became called the Holy Roman Emperor, Gaul had been settled by this monastery movement. Hmm? But that wasn't enough. Because you needed somebody, and this is where like, history is not inevitable, one way or the other. You need courageous, good people who understand fundamental principles, who are willing to risk everything, which is what Schiller called the sublime, in order to drive history forward. Right? So out of nowhere, right, you get this guy by the name of Charlemagne, or Charles the Great. Charlemagne just means Charles the Great. Right? Um, Charlemagne is, is, there was the Merovingian kings. These, by the way, are the cult kings that, that were supposedly, these were guys crazy. Uh, they were supposed to be the blood of Jesus Christ, which were the, the holy blood, holy grail crap that you're going to read about very soon. they got a new movie out on it. Uh, these were the Merovingian kings before Charlemagne, right? Now, what happened was that Charlemagne, his father, Charles Martel, uh, there, there were uh, the Umayyads, who would, who would, and we'll get to that, the Umayyad um, um, Islam from Spain was invading Europe, right? And Charles Martel, who was the great grandfather of Charlemagne, stopped the invasion of Europe. Okay, you can argue whether that was the right thing to do, but that's what he did. Right? On, a, on a certain level, it was the right thing to do. Right. So he defeats them. Charlemagne is from that line. They overthrow the Merovingian kings, right? And Charlemagne comes to rule in uh, uh, in the middle of. What, what later became France, right? Uh, uh, it, it, Aachen was the, the seat of his rule, uh, which is on the border of Germany and France. It's sort of in the middle. And Belgium. And Belgium? Yeah, I guess so. Germany. It's ner journey Belgium and also France. Um, anyway, um, now what's he like? What's, what's so extraordinary about this guy? Well, first of all, uh, he, he was... Uh, um, I mean, frankly, he was a very good fighter. Uh, uh, he, he had a certain quality of courage. Uh, but more importantly, where his courage came from is his understanding of Christianity. That he actually understood, and this is where the filioque, because it was Charlemagne who actually argued against the Byzantines way before the Council of Florence that the filioque was, had to be included in all the creeds. And even though in, in the Nicene Creed has it, or implicitly, he insisted that in all services, the filioque, in, when the creed was read, had to be in there. Right? Now, what did that mean, specifically? You had, on the one hand, he calls Alcuin, who was the Irish monk who, who, or, who actually coordinated the movement of Irish monks in the, in the seven, 750, we're talking about, 730, 740, 750, yeah. Charlemagne, what year is this? Seven, well, seven, a seven, his height was 730, 740, 750, up until 1806. I'm not 1806, 806. 806, yeah, 806, right? Um, it was when he dies, or 802. Um, so what does he do? And this becomes fascinating. He has a literacy movement, which he's in charge of. He brings Alcuin, who is the Irish monk who is running this literacy movement, to become his top advisor. Right? He's a Christian. Right? His top ally is Harun al-Rashid of the Baghdad Caliphate. Right? Now, Islam was a great revolution. 
a great philosophical revolution. Islam is West. It's not Eastern. <laughs> Islam fought the Eastern Byzantine Empire. <laughs> so the crap about them not being part of our culture, they're a fundamental part of our culture, of Western civilization. They were the ones, when Plato had been destroyed throughout Europe, overrun in the Western part of the empire, and Plato had been completely wiped out, Socrates completely wiped out, Aeschylus, Homer, completely wiped out. It was the Islamic revolution that reinstitutes as fundamental learning in their universities the comprehension of astronomy, spherics, Thales, Pythagoras, hmm? and you'll see in later terms they even make an advance with Ibn Sina over, uh, over Plato. But they, they reestablish <coughs> and retranslate into Islamic language, right, Plato and the great works. But, but, but interesting is this, Harun al-Rashid and the Baghdad Caliphates were one of the most extraordinary developments in, in that, in the, really ever. Baghdad is between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Its trading empire went all the way to China, went through North Africa, up through Spain, to the very gates of Charlemagne's empire. Hmm? Basically, Western Europe was a backwater <laughs> compared to the wealth and production of the Islamic East. And they were the ones who saved Plato for the West. The famous Hohenstaufens, who came later than Charlemagne, were in Sicily, and most of their advisors were Islamic. The so-called Holy Roman Emperor, most of his advisors were Islamic. Okay? Uh, Harun al-Rashid and Charlemagne exchange uh, um, embassies. Hmm? Charlemagne sends a Jew, a Christian, and two Christians as his embassy to Harun al-Rashid. Right? Now remember, you have the Irish movements, the monk, the, the the, the monastery movements, right? Harun al-Rashid sends back his advisors, also Jewish, right, and, and Christian. And Charlemagne actually creates an ecumenical alliance of the Christian monasteries, of the learning of the East, right, and the Jews who were his uh, uh, embassy, and creates in his court an ecumenical alliance. Hmm? Because they had to crush Byzantium. Byzantium and Venice were working together. Mm -hmm. right? So, so, that, so that you have, for the first time, in the, in the middle of this so-called feudal period, so-called dark age, and I say so-called, because everything you've learned about history is crap. <laughs> okay? No, really. Because what you had is a flourishing of education and knowledge again. And you had, based upon that flourishing, both in the East in Islam and in the West with the Irish monastery movements. And under the leadership of a personal, personally courageous, committed leader like, uh, like Charlemagne, right? So what does Harun al-Rashid do? to establish the reputation of Charlemagne. He gives him Jerusalem. Harun al-Rashid ceded the birthplace and the sepulcher of Christ with no war and no battle, cedes it to Charlemagne. And what he says is, since you do not have the troops to subdue uh, and, and maintain this place surrounded by what could possibly be enemies, particularly Byzantium, right? I will hold Jerusalem in fife for you. 
I will be your vassal. And I will collect the tax money, and I will send it to you every single year. And Harun al-Rashid, who had a much bigger military, right, and had a much greater cultural capability, hmm, said, for peace and for universal concord, I will make myself Charlemagne's vassal. How's that for the benefit of the other? How's that for an ecumenical alliance? Hmm? Yeah. Did he do that because um, because of Christ? Because they didn't believe in Christ or Christianity? No, he did it. No, he did it because he liked Charlemagne and he wanted peace, world peace. In other, in other words, the clashes they knew on some level that Byzantium was their enemy because the Byzantine Empire was thoroughly evil. Hmm? The actual feudalism, what we call feudalism, was launched by Diocletian, who was the Byzantine emperor. This idea, how did feudalism work? How was it set up? It was set up in the 5th century B, uh, AD. 5th century AD, very early on. The Western Empire was collapsing. right? So what happened was that the, these, these Roman nobles went out into the country and they set up walled cities mm -hmm. for defensive purposes. And since Diocletian had ordered, you had to take the job that your father had, which was law, like the Diocletian reform, so-called reforms. In other words, if, you, if your father was a tanner, you were a tanner. If your father was a peasant, you were a peasant. Right? You had to take, or... or, or if you did not take those jobs, you were in violation of law, you could be killed. Right? So that, so that what happened is these feudal estates with these Roman nobles escaping the collapse of Rome set up these defensive structures where you get a tanner, you get a, a, a knight, you get a this and a that to defend yourself, right? Against the collapse of the, of the Western Rome, uh, of the Western Empire. Hmm? That's how civil. That's that's feudalism. Hmm? That did not dominate. <laughs> hmm? It dominated up until the Irish monk movement, and up until you actually had the creation, on the basis of these literacy movements. Look, if you worked at one of these monasteries and and you didn't want to become a monk, they gave you the land. It was your land, because it was bequeathed <coughs> to them by these chieftains, and therefore. It was your land if you didn't want to become a monk. And you just worked it. It was yours. They titled it to you. The monk, <coughs> the monastery titled it to you. So you had free labor, right? You had upward mobility. You had, you know, this was going on. Mm -hmm. And then under Charlemagne, these great cathedral cities, which were really built around these monasteries, were growing. Mm -hmm. So you had nation, nascent potential for a nation state. Hmm? You, you had this, this potential. Hmm? So Venice went crazy. Okay? Yeah. What land area does Venice and the Byzantium Empire control? Uh, well, they not a whole lot at that point, at this point. I'm just talking about like the area around Italy? Well, they, they had they had Venice, they had trade routes. They controlled the trade routes of the east through Byzantium. Right. In other words, their main holdings were not in Western Europe. Their main holdings and their main trade routes were from the East and bringing goods and other things into uh, Eastern Europe. I mean, Eastern and Western Europe. Right. That's that's how they maintained their power. Right. As trading, they didn't control land. So, like on one flank, you had the Baghdad Caliphate, and on the other flank, you had Charlemagne. Right. Kind of exactly. Thing. Right. But. The weakness of Islam, as was the weakness of Christianity, right, was that you still had the ultramontane papacy, mm -hmm. who had enormous wealth and enormous power, mm -hmm. because these were the old Roman nobility that escaped to Byzantium and, 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 and actually took over the papacy mm -hmm. from Byzantium. Mm -hmm. So that the Benedictine order 
which was the old Roman orders, they had a <coughs> monastery movement, but they didn't allow anybody who wasn't going to be a monk into, the, into these monasteries, right? Nobody wasn't going to be a monk. And number two, nobody young, right? You had to be a certain age before you could get in, right? And they certainly did not uh, transcribe and write the great works uh, uh, of, of previous cultures and civilization, right? Okay, so that, so that what Venice controlled was money, trade routes, the papacy, right, through the Byzantium, right? Charlemagne, through certain manipulations, was able to actually get a, a decent king in there, uh, in, in Byzantium, for a little time, and he got killed, right? All right, so that's the lineup, okay? Now, that's where this discussion of the Crusades comes in, right? Because they were about to lose their power. They were about to lose everything with this movement around the monasteries, around Karun al-Rashid. Now, what did they do? The first thing they did was they had the Norman Vikings. They were the, Vi the Normans later, they were first the Vikings and then they were the Normans. Now, what we hypothesize, we've got to find this out exactly how. Venice was working with the Vikings. The Vikings invaded Ireland in 8-something. And they wiped out the monasteries. Right? Yeah. Um, was this in Russia? No, no, this was in Ireland. I mean, the Vikings, the Vikings were Vikings from the came. northern, from, you know... Scandinavia, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah Russian, the Kia, yeah, the Scythians, they, they're different kinds of Vikings, but they, they, they basically came from northern Europe, uh, and they were pagan tribes, and they, they were deployed somehow into Ireland, and they were deployed into northern Europe to wipe out these <coughs> monasteries. Hmm? <coughs> so you had that. Then you had the internal operation where the Benedictine orders later became... See, there was an interesting thing. Where one of the popes said, well, we shouldn't have two Augustinian orders and Benedictine orders. We should have just one Benedictine order, which was fine with the Augustinians because they vastly outnumbered these guys. So they basically took over the Benedictine order. Right? <laughs> but in the Crusades, you had a... Remember, the Crusaders went to the base of the population. Hmm? you know, uh, Urban and this guy, Peter the Hermit, and they launched populist movements, <laughs> right, uh, in the base of the population to demand that the Holy Land must be ceded, even though it had been ceded <coughs> before, right? But the Holy Land must be gotten back. And they created these populist movements. Hmm? So that at the First Crusade, where the First Crusade was preached by Urban the, the, the Second, Right, in 1095, you had hundreds of thousands of people there. They had gone through the French countryside and mobilized them. Right, So the combination of the Viking invasion and the, um, and the Cistercians under Bernard of Clairvaux, who preached the Crusades inside the religious orders and set up the Knights Templar, the Knights Hospitaller, and the uh, and these uh, uh, the Teuton, Teutonic knights, right, created religious orders out of these marauding knights. Mm -hmm. The combination of that, this ultramontane takeover, using the uh, um, using the Crusades and the image of the Crusades as a wedge issue, right? Because that's what it was. It was a wedge issue, right? was capable of crushing inside the church this movement. Mm -hmm. Because of the weakness of certain things in Islam, where there, certain, there was other operations, there were satirian operations inside Islam. right? So that what happens is that by 1095, you have a reversal of this process, which I discussed last time, so I'm not going to go through all of that again. Right? But I want to say something very interesting because you have this fascinating 
problem. Remember, I'm, I'm always attacking empire, right? <laughs> if you ever heard me, I attack empire. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dante in De Monarchia <coughs> defends empire. Okay? That's, and by the way, it's unambiguous. He's defending the Holy Roman Empire. Right? But what is he defending? He's defending Charlemagne and the Hohenstaufen, who were working in the ecumenical alliances with the Islamic revolution. Right? So you can't get caught up in words. Hmm? Because these words have very specific meanings. Dante was in a war against the papacy. He actually put living popes in hell in his in his uh, in his uh, 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 Divine Comedy, right? For simony and other th practices, right? They were living, and he had them in hell. Okay, upside down in hell, in fact. Uh, uh, um, so Dante was in a war with the ultramontane papacy as was Petrarch. Hmm? And they were defending in De Monarchia the Holy Roman emperor, Emperors of Charlemagne, of uh, the Fredericks, uh, the Frederick I, Frederick II, and the Ottonians, right? And what he was also defending was this thing called De Vulgaria Eloquentia, that you had to be able to infuse a language as Shelley talks about in the defense of poetry, with the capability of profound, conveying profound ideas with respect to man and nature. Hmm? Therefore, if you read it, and it's empire, I mean, it's empire all over it, okay? That's what it says. And it's an Aristotelian argument of all things. It is. It's an Aristotelian argument. Dante makes an Aristotelian argument, because that's how you had to argue law. Inside the church, the only way you can argue law is by logic. So Dante, being a genius, uses logic to overthrow logic. <laughs> okay? And you read it, you know, I read it, I said, my God, has he lost his mind? Was he depressed? What the hell is this thing, right? <laughs> really, I read it. I read it last week. I said, what's the matter with him? Has he gone nuts? What, did he get demoralized? No. <laughs> but then I, it was explained to me. From Summa Theologica on, you had to argue logic in law courts, particularly before the papacy. Right? So he makes a perfectly logical argument right, for why an empire must be had. Okay? Perfectly logical argument. To what? To overthrow the ultramontane. To overthrow the papacy. He uses the papal logic and the papal arguments to overthrow the papacy which is what he was up to, to found the ultramontane papacy, to found and establish nation states, not nation states per se, but entities, political, secular entities, right, that were committed to the commonwealth, hmm? the commonwealth of mankind, with their language, with their language, and their images, and their metaphors, right, to bring them to a higher conception, which is what Charlemagne was, which was what, what Harun al-Rashid was, which is what the Hohenstaufen were. I mean, what they said about the Hohenstaufen, there's a whole other class I want to give someday fairly soon, which takes it from the period of the Carolingian Empire to Dante's revolution up to Cusa, and you'll see. But, but there is unmistakably Feudalism was, was, was a construct, right? Because if you try to say there was a dark age and then all of a sudden a renaissance came out of it, you don't know a damn thing. The world doesn't work that way. Humanity never died. Never died. Even in the collapse of the Roman Empire, St. Augustine, just as Lynn in the collapse of civilization now, revolutionizes knowledge. Hmm? And on the basis of that knowledge, and we're, because we have America, remember, he was talking in the Roman Empire. There wasn't a whole lot of chance to win in his lifetime. Okay? So he had to establish a movement based upon these ideas to what? To found America, even though he didn't even know it. <laughs> right? 
to found a nation, an idea based upon these ideas of mankind, right? So there was never a dark age, per se, when humanity was snuffed out totally. Never. It never happened. Not conceivable. We don't go that way, right? <laughs> really. Now, by establishing America upon these fundamental principles which never died in the collapse of Rome, right, we've got a good shot at winning. So, that's what I have. What exactly what it is. Uh, see, it, it comes from a pseudo Platonism. There was some very straight, you see, look, these cults, the guys who set up these cults are not totally stupid, right? <laughs> so they take Plato and they say, well, there's the, and you, by the way, any grab course you're going to get on Plato, right, is going to say this. There's a spirit world, you know, uh, and then there's phenomena, there's noumena and phenomena. Right, the spirit world and the physical world, right, and that's in Plato, and you have the forms, right, and these forms impress themselves on the, you know, the physical world, and it's Manichaean, and how does the spiritual world, which cannot be touched, communicate with the physical world, right? How do, because they're totally separate through demons. <laughs> called D-A-E-M-O-N, demon, right? And if you have a strict duality, if you really do have such a strict duality, that's the only way the spiritual world could communicate. Send that down angels or devils, really, uh, um, and communicate with this evil body thing. Right? Uh, I, I had to tell you, it's a funny story. I like to tell funny stories. Um, this is a true story. I was up, Lynn was facing some trial in Boston, and I was up in Boston. And, you know, Boston's a strange place. Because <laughs> I was in a hotel, and I was tired, and some guy comes on. I never heard of him before. And it's Jimmy Swag. Right? And I had never heard of him before. This is in the 1970s. Uh, no, well, no, it wasn't in the 70s. It was 87, 88, something like that. Um, no, 88, 80, yeah, 87, 88, somewhere there. So all of a sudden, you know, he's talking about the good works they're doing, setting up hospitals here, and with your money, they're setting up hospitals. <laughs> you know, it's something sort of interesting. And then he starts attacking the press. I said, hey, right on, you know. Uh, I'm with you on that, right? And then all of a sudden, this is a true story, he says, well, I'll tell you one thing. The body is evil, Right? It's just evil, it's pure evil. And he starts writhing on the ground and screaming and yelling. Like, Whoa! You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think it was so. I asked Lynn, because I mean, nobody knew who Swagger was at that point. He was, he was just starting out. So I asked Lynn, I said, I said, send him a letter, Jerry. I said, okay. He said, cut off the organ that doth offend me. Right, which is in the Bible, right? Uh, you know, if, if the hand offend me, cut off the hand. <laughs> so, uh, so I actually did send him the letter. I, I suspect he didn't. Later on, he got in trouble for other things. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's Manichaean. That's, that's literally Manichaean, right? And he got, and God talks to him through these demons, right? At night. <laughs> Right? <laughs> he closed his eyes and these demons talk to him. Jimmy, that woman's beautiful, ain't she? You know, you got to get her. You know? <laughs> God told me so, right? Uh, so that's Jimmy Swagger. But that's really what Manichaeanism is. And in fact, Augustine was part of this Manichaean operation because he was a Platonist and was trying to make sense of it. And then, basically, what Augustine realized in the course, and you can read this in the Confessions, right, is he said, look, um, 
there is a power in this universe um, greater than myself. And that, that my job is to... I can be great, but only as I let this power and knowledge infuse myself. There, there's no split between the body and the spirit. The body is part of the spirit. The spirit is part of the body. Right? All of them are part of the universe in universal principle. And it was a fundamental discovery. And it was one of the most powerful coming to grips in the age. He had to. Look, it was a dark age. He was living in a dark age. Rome was collapsing at a very rapid rate. And uh, you know he was part of one of the outskirts of the empire, not right in Rome, but he was in Carthage, where he got trained in Carthage. Where, where, you know, so he really had to totally revolutionize, personally revolutionize. Really, that's what jihad, by the way, is. This crap about jihad. Jihad is a personal fight with yourself to become fully human. That, that's what jihad is. Right? This other stuff is, is crazy propaganda. Right? So, that, so anyway, that's what Augustine describes in his uh, City of God. Okay? Any other? Yeah, Ed. Uh, I was just curious. Could you go through some of the sort of uh, funny or clinical characteristics of, of the oligarchy around uh, some of this time period around? Uh, oh, sure. Like the Roman Empire. Because I just think it's sort of important to see like they, how they react to like, the good that's going and like the type of binds that they're well, like for instance, you, you take um, take for instance. Um, I'll tell you a funny story, okay? Which is true. It's a true story. Uh, I studied uh, reading all this crap. About, it, it, it always is true, by the way. It's, they're, they're the only funny stories. You, you're funnier than stuff you can make up, right? Uh, the goal. The, um, one of the tribes of uh, Germanic tribes had invaded Rome fairly early on uh, and actually overrun the city of Rome. And the uh, what the Roman oligarchy senate decided to do was sit absolutely motionless in uh, on thrones when the barbarians broke the city wall. And they sat motionless, right, on the throne. And at first the barbarians were superstitious. Thought, what well, are these men? Are these gods? Right? And then somebody sneezed and they killed the whole every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> True story. True story. Uh, so that's not a good that's not a good way to go, right? <laughs> Convince them you're gods, right? Because you're white or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good way to go. Uh, so that's one clinical manifestation. Uh, but most, but, but look, I mean, how, what's the real clinical manifestation as opposed to the kind of crazy stuff you see? Um, the most dramatic clinical manifestation was that they can't see their own doom. And this Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, writes a lot about, particularly in The Mask of the Red Death, uh, which is... Uh, one of Poe's great stories uh, about the oligarchy cannot see its own doom. Uh, and that's what happened with Venice in this period. I, I went through it at the last discussion where um, they had looted Europe to the point by rigging the gold and silver rates, right, in which they had transformed the uh, Many of the city-states or the kings had contracted their debts in silver because that was the currency of Europe at the time. And these kings owed Venice X in silver. So Venice cornered the silver market by upvaluing gold, which they had stolen from the east, the Mongol Khans. They had a deal with the Mongol Khans to steal all the gold in the East, bring it to Venice for goods. Venice would buy up the silver and drive the silver out using gold currency. Right? 
then when they drove all the silver out, right, the guys who contracted the, the debts in silver, they upvalued the gold. They hoarded the silver and upvalued the price of gold. So the guys who owed X in silver had to pay X more in silver to cover the gold price, right? And they couldn't get it. So what happened was the famous, the most famous one was Edward III of England made a, uh, uh, had contracted and had uh, tr kept on rolling over his debt. You know how these third world countries get, right? They kept on rolling over his debt to the point that one, even one payment to Venice was more than the total wool, total people, total land of England. And then he said, well, I'm a Christian. I forced you into usury. I'm going to be a Christian and get you out of usury by declaring a debt moratorium. Right? And then the whole Bardi Peruzzi bank, the whole banking system collapsed at that point with that pinprick. It was that way with everywhere in Europe. But that pinprick brought down the whole system. And, and that brought on the Black Death. Right? In other words, they had so looted not only Europe, but the Black Death came from the east to the west. They had looted the east so badly and destroyed Islam right, in the process, right? The process, you know, the developments of Islam using Aristotelianism that in fact, and the Mongol hordes paid for by Venice and organized by Venice, who to hit where, right? They basically didn't see their own doom coming. And they got wiped out. And but Cusa and Piccolomini, Sylvanus, took over the papacy in the Council of Florence and reestablished the Filioque, and then you had the Renaissance. So the, the real clinical manifestation of this thing, there are different aspects of it, is the fact that they really never see it coming. They never they're so enamored with their own power. This is the story of the gods of Olympus. Right, right. Where the gods of Olympus, and you know Homer is great on this. If you want to know about the gods of Olympus, read Homer. It's hilarious. Right. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to give that lecture tonight, but, but um, these guys, you know, uh, they they are supposedly uh, invincible. Okay, they, they, no physical uh, power can over uh, can destroy their immortality. Right. But their immortality doesn't make them good. Right. The immortality actually is an impulse to evil, to capriciousness. Since you never pay the price hmm, of your immorality in your flesh, right, in your existence, then why not do crazy evil things, right? And they're always fornicating with animals, with each other, you know, getting pissed off, you know, rageful, bonking each other, you know, I. With, with lightning and other kinds of crazy things. Right? <laughs> and there's a funny scene, and just to show you how bizarre the, these oligarchs really are. Zeus, the king of kings, the great leader of Olympus, right? What's the first scene in Homer? You know, Achilles, uh, you know, has been, got pissed off because Briseis, his concubine, was stolen by Agamemnon, the head of the Greek forces. So he prays for destruction of the Greek forces till they come on their knees to beg him. Great, right? They come on their knees to beg him to save them from the Trojans, right? So that's the first scene, right? What's so next? Next scene, they, that's what the men now to the gods, right? So Achilles' mother, who's a goddess, who's very pretty, right? Is asked Achilles says to Achilles, "I'll talk to Zeus and we'll make sure the Greeks get her." Until they come begging to you, right? So, all, so, her, so the next scene is Zeus, high and mighty Zeus. First scene, right? This pretty young goddess is at his knees begging him, and he's what's his first words? Get up, Hera will see you. His wife. If Hera sees you, I'm in big trouble, right? It's almost verbatim the quote, right? Get up. He says, I can't get up until you agree this, that, and the other thing. He says, Look, get up. I agree. Just get up, right? And that's the first scene. This is the great gods of Olympus, right? <laughs> you know. And then, true story. I'm not making this up. I don't have this kind of wit. If I did, I'd, I'd write my own epic poem. Right? Is this the Iliad? This is the Iliad, right? First scene. Okay, the Trojans come out. They're loaded for bear. You know, Hector's ready to go, right? Uh, and they're all ready to go. 
and they're facing the Greeks. Okay. Now, at first, the Greeks are slaughtering the hell out of the Trojans, right? Uh, no, no. At first, no. The Trojans are slaughtering the hell out of the Greeks because Zeus had agreed that the Trojans were going to kick ass, right? <laughs> but Hera, who actually saw Achilles' mother, it didn't work. First, she tried to get her son Hephaestus, who's the god of lightning. Oh, no. no. Uh, he's the smith, you know, of you know, Vulcan, Hephaestus, whatever. So he's he works at the the billows or whatever. So he he's a hunchback. So she tries to convince him to attack Zeus, Hera, because she's pissed off that Zeus is messing around. So so Hephaestus says, Mom, last time you tried me to get to do this, I did attack Zeus. He swore me three times around his head, threw me. And I, I, I landed. I went for three months and landed on my ass in Lesbos. <coughs> True story. <laughs> I don't know if it happened, but that's what was said. Right? So he said, "Forget it. I'm not going to do this." And he starts. He's a hunchback, so he starts serving, and everybody starts laughing. It's like out of Shakespeare, right? Okay. Okay. So now, so the Trojans are killing everyone because Zeus has agreed they're going to kill a lot of Greeks before. You know, the Greeks come and beg Achilles to come back, right? So what does Hera do? She puts on Venus's belt, right? Uh, to seduce Zeus. She seduces him behind a cloud, right? He can't see anything, right? All of a sudden, the Greeks rally, start slaughtering the Trojans while he's, you know, doing what he's doing, right? right? So he wakes up like... Two, three hours later, in a stupor, looks down and says, oh, shit. <laughs> what the hell happened here? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, this, is, this is the gods of Olympus. They, they're goofy. <laughs> the best, right? Uh, but, but that's really oligarchism. Well, it's based on, like, true, true things. And well, I, you know, true things. Um, you know, I don't know this. No, 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 no. It, well... First of all, you know, as Lynn points out, there was a, the Olympians versus the Titans. There was that really happened, right? What's more important in Homer? See, we we tend to think of truth in a funny way. Did it really physically happen? Well, first of all, you don't even know even what physically. You may see an event, but you don't know what really happened. Yeah. If you're a Platonist, you, you really don't know what happened. You may see it, but it doesn't tell you what happened, right? So in a sense, this, this idea of metaphor is actually more truthful in many cases. See, why, why, does, why does Shakespeare work? Right? Why does it work? Why did he understand, and why do people understand Rome better from Shakespeare than if they had read Gibbon and Mommsen and any other way of doing it? Hmm? Because it's a metaphor. Right? People grasp a universal principle involved. The universal principle of tragedy. Mm -hmm. When they want, they see this and they keep rooting for guys who make these stupid errors, right? And then you find out what you're rooting for isn't worth it anyway, right? And you're left with a paradox, a really a platonic paradox, which is resolved or hinted at in the role of Cicero. Mm -hmm. The Cicero was the only Platonist in Rome. And he was actually a Platonist, right? But he was powerless to, to deal with this problem of the new C, of Caesar, right? So, so you had to, in a sense, indicate there's a solution, as does Plato. But you have to go through this process where you wake up and say, "Oh my God, this whole thing is a disaster." I mean, if you go through Julius Caesar and then Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Everybody gets killed except Octavius, who later becomes Augustus, right? He's the only one left standing. Mm -hmm. That really happened. But did it happen exactly? Did this dialogue occur? Well, in a sense, yes, though it wasn't said by words. It creates a real condensed metaphor in which you get at the point more powerfully than if it so-called saw it happen at the time. Most of the time, it's confusing anyway. Yeah. That that didn't actually happen. Right. Like she got burned at the stake, but in the ending, right. in the play, her soul. She right. did. She did something different. It was it's like 
it's a metaphor. Well, she breaks her chains. She breaks her chains. Miraculously breaks her chains and saves the king. Which is true. More true than so-called being burned at the stake. You know, so, yeah, it, it's something like that. So in the, in the hands of a poet, that's sort of the way it works. Yeah? I'd listen to continuity of your idea during, after you had developed how um, Haruna Rashid gave Jerusalem yeah. to um, Charlemagne, and then you were going through how there's a certain weakness of Islam, you're talking about a certain faction of the... Uh, the Christian priests, or I'm not sure if this is... Yeah, right. The priests, uh, they weren't having young but, people involved. And then, then you went into the development of the crusade. That, that right, well, look, what, what happens is this. I, I gave a, The reason I was sort of short is I gave a lecture, I guess it was a month ago, uh, on this specific point. So I, I, I shrunk it. Let me go through it briefly, right? Um... You had, with the beginning of the Charlemagne developments, you had a succession of Holy Roman Emperors, which was Charlemagne, and then Otto, and then Frederick, then, I forget, and Frederick II, right? They were totally involved in ecumenical alliances with Islam. Okay, Frederick the most, Frederick Kosh opened the most, right? Okay. That's what was going on. But increasingly, <coughs> the, the uh, Venice, remember, these guys have enormous power in terms of trading power, pure economic power. Right? It wasn't really until the American Revolution that this power was broken. Europe never actually got rid of these guys. Hmm? So they had enormous raw economic power through trading routes, through debts of kings. You didn't have nation states, right? You had potentials, but you didn't have nation states. It really wasn't until 1348 and the whole goddamn system collapsed on its ass that they lost their power. Hmm? And then under those conditions, that's the precondition, because I tell you something, without individuals like Augustine, without Cusa, history is not inevitable. The zeitgeist, the Hegel says, the world spirit, if we do, if there wasn't a Napoleon, the world spirit would have created Napoleon. Bullshit. Bullshit. That's Manichaeanism. Right? That, that's, you know, that's the worst of Manichaeanism. Right? Evil would produce evil. Right? Forget it. No. The reality was that when they lost their power after the 1348 Black Death, and one third of Europe got wiped out, and most of, of, of uh, then you had under Cusa fairly uh, and, and a dialogue with Byzantium. It's interesting. Cusa brought together um, Demistus Plethon, uh, uh, and they brought all of Plato's texts. See, Plato's texts were in in Byzantium, so they brought the Platonic text to the Council of Florence. It was a great translation project and the learning of ancient Greek in and around the Council of Florence in the Medici Castle. And that's a strange story, too, because the Medicis weren't always that great. Right? In other words, they're humans. Right? So you, there's potential everywhere. Right? So, so what happened is that um, that's what happened. But the way, in other words, what they had to get the base organized. So they had to create a wedge issue, which was, we've got to take Jerusalem, which was a lot of crap. First of all, it was given them, yeah, right? Yeah. But that was later. But then they lost it, right? And, and certain Muslim factions took it back, right? So then they preached the crusade to take over Jerusalem as a wedge issue. Hmm? And then they said anyone who would go to the crusades, either pilgrim or crusader, was absolved of all sins, present, past, future, anything you're going to do, you're going to be absolved. Right? Which was a pretty good deal. Right? <laughs> Plus, you didn't have to pay your taxes to the Pope. In other words, if you went on, on a pilgrimage, if you were a knight going on a pilgrimage, and you sent so many people to the pilgrimage, you didn't have to pay taxes. Right? To the... And Venice was the big tax collector. Right? 
So that's how they did it. But if they didn't have the Crusades and these wedge issues, right, they couldn't have done it. Hmm? But you didn't have the power. You see, you got to see how important the United States is. We broke their power. In 17, by 1783, we broke their power militarily. And by 1787, we broke it psychologically. Hmm? It was never done in the history of mankind. And then we consolidated in 1864 to 1868, and we became the premier military power on the planet. That's why they hate Lynn and they hate us. And they hate this cultural potential. But look at it from the broad sweep and you see what it is. It's extraordinary. No European could point to that. Even though they were from very great moments.